Welcome to episode number 149 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today we have Mike Ogilvy. Mike is a profit coach and international professional speaker. He's an experienced chartered accountant by training, and he's the major shareholder and managing director of X5 Accountants. Most of his time is focused on his work as uh, the UK's leading profit coach and with his company, The Profit Team. Uh, Mike is an avid mountain climber, having scaled mountains in Mount Kinabalu, uh, Snowden, and even in the region of Patagonia, which is in Argentina and Chile. So Mike, uh, so excited to have you on the podcast today. Welcome. Thank you, Kevin. I'm looking looking forward to sharing ideas with you. Well, Mike, uh, there aren't too many of us around. You describe yourself as a profit coach, and I know I do my, my clients as a profit maximization expert. For any of the listeners uh, who haven't encountered uh, someone like that, maybe give us a bit of a background. What is it that you do and how do you do it? Okay, it's, uh, it's pretty simple in terms of, you know, you're trained as an accountant to learn how to understand figures and I, I learned very quickly that uh, when you're dealing with business owners um, there's no point just uh, saying this is what you've got to do because uh, they don't respect it the the way you can get through and help somebody in business is by uh, coaching them by saying um, asking them the right questions so that they can then find the answers for themselves so even though you know um, you know the uh, answers you're looking for you've got to make sure you ask the right questions so they can then find the answers for themselves so that they are then setting their own uh, goals, asking their own questions. So coaching is fundamentally listening and helping. And that's that's why I do differently as opposed to the old fashioned consultant who says, this is what you've got to do. And I think there's real power in that. As you say, uh, if someone is asked a question and comes up with their own answer, then they're going to buy into that and uh, and take uh, more likely take the relevant action. And Absolutely. I think one of the ch- ch- oh, sorry one of the challenges for a lot of business owners is actually in understanding those numbers. And I, I kind of guess uh, you know the accountant's role typically is to take what's happened in the business and turn that into numbers. But then I guess you go the extra step is you take those numbers and help translate that uh, for your clients into what action they need to be taking. Yeah, I, I, I also try and take it beyond numbers. I, I mean, I, I talk about things like profit robbers, things because most people look at stuff that's been uh, comes out of their computer. And so you tend to get finances, you tend to get sales in, in as absolutes, you tend to get uh, purchases, you tend to get overheads. So sales, I try and break down into uh, transactions. And so, you know, when you when you're looking at maximizing profit, the easiest way is to increase your prices. But, you know, you can't just do that without getting other things right, you know, whether it's customer service, whether it's um, the quality of the product, quality of the service. There's so many variables in there, but very few people uh, measure some of those um, issues. And so when I talk about things like profit robbers, um, these aren't things that are measured in uh, accounting software. And they're things like poor communication, poor listening, poor marketing. And so I will try and break down uh, um, the whole concept of sales and let's try and get measure and a really good example I had of that just to share with you was um, I was dealing with a business that was dealing with pallets you know sort of very simple and I said to them um, what's differentiating you why are you being so successful and uh, they said well it's all about the speed of turnaround and I said so what's your speed of turnaround then and they weren't measuring it yet that was the main that was the main thing that was actually differentiating them and so while it was going well fantastic of course if it started slipping then we all know that uh, you know in terms of a lead indicator um, if turnaround is uh, is um, a key key indicator if it starts slipping your sales are going to start slipping six months time and so and they weren't measuring it and so this is quite simple but you just have to get down into uh, the nitty-gritty behind the figures so important and you identify a key measurement like that and you uh, you want to watch it like a hawk because like you say uh, you know in advance if that's going to cause a problem down the track so yeah. uh, you, you mentioned the profit robbers and you alluded to two or three there if someone's listening and they're concerned that they have profit robbers in their business or they're not seeing the kind of uh, profit that they like what's uh, where should they start looking what, what can they do well kevin you've you've seen um videos of me throwing money on the floor and i always go, i go into businesses and i uh, I often actually do those in the business. I start throwing uh, dollars and pounds down on the floor and say, you know, in your reception, in your car park, in your factory, in your offices, there's pound notes, there's dollars all over the place. Um, and what uh, what has to happen for you to uh, be able to pick it up? And uh, the point I'm trying to get to people there is you've got to be able to see them first before you can pick them up. And then I say, well, what needs to happen for you to be able to see them? Because they're there in your office already, but you're not seeing them. 
And the, cr the critical issue in order to be able to see them is you've got to care. And so many, so many people will walk past a $50 note and say, well, that's not my $50 note. Um, so why should I care? It's not, it's not mine. And if you, can f if you can find a game that they can play that suddenly makes them interested in that $50 note, then suddenly they'll start seeing that and they'll also see the hundred dollar note that's uh, around the corner. And it's, it's just playing with people's uh, mindsets and attitudes to get them to understand. So the, the waste is the biggest profit robber, you know, apart from um, one that we've discussed previously, which uh, you also use it, um, the, big, the biggest uh, profit robber in any business, um, which we might come to shortly. Oh, and for the people listening, they're going to be very intrigued. What is what is this profit robber that we've discussed? OK, so uh, most people have got uh, their sales figures. Um, and uh, so when I actually go in there and said, well, what, what price are you selling at? And uh, how many how many customers are you selling at your full price? And when I actually look down and see how much uh, discount is being given in the business, um, normally the biggest profit robber I find in most businesses is the discount that they're giving compared to what they feel their price should be at. And most people are not measuring that. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you bring this up. Uh, I tell my clients there's three rules around pricing. Number one is don't discount. Number two is don't discount. And number three is don't discount. So uh, we're, we're on completely the same page with that one. And it's staggering. Uh, I know when we discussed this before, we we're discussing about what an impact it makes because depending on your gross profit margin, even if you take a small percentage off of the revenue, it can make a massive uh, reduction in your gross margin. It can, it can eat quite a lot of your profit very quickly there. And of course, there's many other ways to uh, to uh, help your clients see additional value to help them spend the same amount of money or more money just in the way you can position things and, and frame things. So I'm so glad you brought that one up. Uh, now, I have a really, uh, really important question for you around this. For people who have a team, you said it comes down to the mindset and attitude of the team, right? Whether they're engaged, whether they want to see that money on the floor, whether they want to bend over and pick that pick that money up. What what can we do to help improve the mindset or the attitude of the team so they actually care and they want to? It's a really interesting one, and uh, I wish I had the answer. And uh, I think it comes down to the difference between management and leadership. And I'm a big believer that you can't manage people. I think uh, you can only lead people. I think um, management is for systems and leadership is for people. And so leadership is about inspiration, about getting people to follow, about setting good examples and uh, getting people to want to do it, not because they've been told to do it. So systems is this is how we do it here. And so you can manage systems and you can get other people to help manage those systems to make sure they're applied properly. But that leadership is to uh, get into the hearts and minds of your team and make them want to, and to also sometimes to weed out those people who become the uh, sort of internal terrorists, the uh, internal profit robber, because of their attitude, um, they cause disruption in the team. And so leadership is about getting getting those people and weeding them out of the organisation as soon as you can. You know, I talk I talk about sort of executing them legally. You know, just uh, <laughs> you know, get them out there, but make sure you get HR um, to tell you what you can do so you can do it uh, and do it properly. Yes, I, I think that's, uh, that's super important. Otherwise, you do that in a bad way and it's going to cost you more money and Absolutely. that will be another, another profit robber there. Exactly. Uh, in terms of the motivation, I, I think it's interesting. I know in some of the organizations I work with, they've helped um, you know, give the team a bonus based on you know the percentage uh, of profitability or, or achieving profitability numbers. That's, that's one way that you can link people up. Um, one organization in particular was looking to get ready for a sale and you know selling the business for selling part of the business and they knew that they would have an eight times multiple something like that when they sold the business eight times a profit so that really sharpened the minds of the uh, the team because if they had shares in that they were saying well look for every dollar you save when the business gets sold that's going to turn into eight dollars so yeah. it was a great way to magnify people's minds and and see actually uh the dollar here and a dollar there actually doesn't sound like much but when you times it by eight it becomes a real real big number yeah, I think that's good for senior people. And I think for um, less senior people, that's, uh, I mean, there's done all, all the research across the world that money is a motivator only to a certain level. Um, so um, it's really important to just get people feeling part of uh, an organization they want to be part of. 
And so this whole thing, so if you've just got, if you've got clusters of people who are just not part of the team, um, then, you know, you've, you've got, you're just never going to achieve it. It doesn't matter how much money you offer, um, they're never going to be part of it. And it's, and I'm afraid it's, there is now, and I hate generalizing, but um, we are faced with a new ethos in terms of um, the new generation um, are in, know they are entitled to quality of life. They know they're entitled to not have to work all hours. Um, so they, they are expecting to be able to work to get um, good pay um, and not necessarily be accountable like the previous generation. And it's, uh, you know, I, you know, I realize I'm generalizing, but uh, I'm seeing it across the board now. So I'm seeing it in my own business, but I'm seeing it in other people's businesses. It is a new problem that we've never had to face with before. And so really engagement is so, so important. Um, it's hearts and minds and it's, it's just not easy. You are on the money and uh, completely aligned with our previous podcast guest on episode number 148, Paul Terwall. I don't know if you uh, you know Paul, but he was also talking about uh, engagement and how uh, I'm struggling to remember the statistics. I think he said something something around the, the team when they're they're not engaged. Um, you know, productivity is down 20 percent. Sick leave, uh, you know, is up 40 percent. So so all of those things really, uh, really time. We're going to keep those people super, super engaged. Uh, now, Mike, you, you told us about discounting and how that's the biggest robber. Of course, the opposite of that uh, is uh, around you know, increasing our prices and actually helping to accomplish more revenue per product. I, I think you have an interesting story around that, about how people can do that, or an experience you had uh, that helped really pull that into your mind. Yeah, that's it is actually, thanks for that. that I mean, it, uh, one of the stories I use when I uh, speak at conferences, uh, as a signature story, is the pineapple man. And so this is a poor guy in uh, Barbados. I mean, poor is a, an emotive term, but poor to many of us uh, in, a, in another world. But... He's, a, he's not poor in his head because he's actually selling pineapples for $200 on a beach. Now, anybody who can actually achieve that, you think, well, wow, um, how on earth does that happen? And uh, we were sit, um, in this beach in St. James's in Barbados on the first day, and he, he just engaged with us. Um, and like, like so many of these beach sellers, um, he had his back on his, uh, on his back, he had his uh, sort of satchel, and uh, he didn't try and sell us one thing. He just engaged with us and said, hello, uh, you know, Welcome to Barbados. You're new here. I haven't seen you around. And uh, told told us to be very careful about the leaves uh, on the uh, forest that we were walking through on the edge of the water. He said, if those leaves fall on your shoulders, you could uh, get acidic burns, could ruin your holiday. Next day, we bumped into us again, gave us some tips, didn't try and sell us anything. One of our wives said, you know, what are you trying to sell us? And, oh, no, you never ask a salesman what you're trying to sell. Um, <laughs> and he just laughed and he says, madam, I don't try and sell anything. He says, people buy pineapples from me. And I thought, this guy's cute. Um, so uh, I just watched. And then another one of the wives said, how much are you selling your pineapples? I thought, oh, my God. And I said, no, never ask a salesman um, what they're <laughs> selling for. And he just said, oh, madam, he said, people pay $200 for my pineapple. So we parted company very quickly and uh, um, with much laughter. And he never, he never tried to sell us anything. Um, and we bumped into him again. And he said, tell me when you're ready to try the experience of my pineapples. So that was really interesting. Try the experience of my pineapples. And we laughed, we were playing golf. And I said, look, right, day seven, we'll meet up. And uh, cut the story short, he came along, found us on day seven, and he starts singing away. And pineapples are great for my chest. They help me to digest and all sorts of things. He's singing away, there's a crowd gathering as he peels this pineapple, just like an apple, and cuts out the notches. Um, he's holding the pineapple flesh with a clean um, freezer bag. So he never touches it with a flourish. He swishes off the uh, spiky feathers. And I suddenly realized that I never asked him the price. And I said, so his name was Original. I said, Original, that's amazing. Um, what's the price? He said, oh, Mike, he said, I've come to think of you as a friend. Let's call it $100. And I just laughed and I said, Original, I've come to think of you as a friend. Um, shall we call it 20? And I gave him a $20 note. Um, he took the $20 note with a glint in his eye, said, nice doing business with you. And I, I asked the people in the audience, I said, um, do you think I was had? And the men always say, definitely, you've been really sold a pup there. The women say, no, not a chance. That's an amazing experience. He deserved every, every bit of that $20. And it's just a different mindset. And so the point, I've been back and seen him three times and he gets his $20 out of me. And I just, I see what he's, uh, what he's actually achieved, talk to him about it. 
And I said, you know, do, um, do you actually get $200? Yeah, I said, what, from Americans? I said, oh, yeah. I said, what, the British? No, they're far too tight. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's an attitude mindset. So the Americans just say, well, for the experience, they obviously enjoy, they fall in love with him, and they're happy to part with $200. And the, the point, I go and talk, uh, so I do his marketing for him. I said, if you ever go to Barbados, you need to look up the pineapple man. And if we can do that in business, then we could all be selling our own pineapples, our own versions of pineapples, as long as we can make the experience that something people want to be part of. And then price does not become a major factor in what we're doing. It's really quite simple. I love that. It is about the experience. And I think the other point I'll draw on there, it's probably about your audience as well. If you're targeting uh, tight British people, <laughs> and maybe you can get a better deal from another another audience uh, like, like your Americans or something else. It's, it's very fascinating because the experience is a really key piece there. The other bit I love about that story is the idea of like a, a price contrast. You know, he's telling you 200, 200, 200, 200. So all of a sudden, $20 seems completely reasonable. Yeah. Uh, had he started off, uh, you know, with a price of 20, you know, that would be way too expensive because, you know, these things are probably anywhere four or five dollars, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, that that whole frame there, you know, to get you down to 20, started with a high number was uh, was a very smart move on his part. I really love that story. And Mike, so you, you spend a lot of your time traveling around uh, helping organizations uh, understand how to implement this, uh, you know, this this amazing content and how to maximize their profitability. Um, have you got any uh, any good tips or advice, you know, in addition to what you shared already that uh, our listeners today can actually start by implementing straight away? No, I think um, the crucial thing is to know where they're going and ask themselves why. So, you know, one of the one of the questions that you um, uh, concentrate on in your podcast is uh, the you know you, the quality of your life depends on the quality of answers, uh, quality of questions you ask yourself. Because if you don't ask yourself good quality questions, you don't get yourself good quality answers. And so one of the things I I find in business, everybody is so busy being busy, um, they forget why they started in business. They forget what they're trying to achieve, and so they just become uh, you know Michael Gerber uh, famously uh, called it the tyranny of routine. So they're dealing with a phone call, they're dealing with the staff, they're dealing with the customer, and they get to the end of the day and say, what on earth have I done today? And uh, the whole point about successful businesses, they have a clear idea of what they're trying to achieve. And so when they're looking at uh, what they're doing, is what I'm doing now helping me to achieve my goals? So one of the clear, that's one of the clear things that I try and bring to the business, clarity and focus. But another thing is I try and ask them to ask why. So we always talk about smart goals and things, so define the what. So I find so many businesses don't define their what. But more importantly, the Simon Sinek question is, um, do they know their why? You know, is that what um, that they've got there? Is it uh, something that's been imposed on them? Something they feel they ought to do rather than um, something they want to do? Because, you know, achieving it has to be emotional. It has to be something that's going to drive you. It can't be something that you feel dispassionate about, but you just feel you have to do it. So that's not a goal that's ever going to work. So you have to, um, there has to be emotion wrapped in it. So one of the things I, I major on is asking people why. So tell me, if we've got a uh, goal, clearly defined, got some sort of time um, specification on it, and then ask why, and we try and drill down on that. And then if we've got some emotional impact on that in the why, there's far more chance of it actually being achieved. So, so uh, powerful. So get really clear on what you want specifically. And I think you mentioned two important points there. It, uh, you need to know specifically what it is and there needs to be a time, uh, time target on that. And why? Because if we don't have an emotional juice, the chances are that once we get going and things get tough or things get challenging, yeah, well, yeah. why are we going to continue when <laughs> there's no, no reason, uh, reason behind that? And so I, I think that that becomes super clear. Uh, the, the thing that you just shared there, which really pulls it out, if we're not clear on why, then chances are it's, it's not a goal that we want. It's maybe something that we believe that we should be doing or is yeah. an expectation of someone else. So that, that really pulls it to, uh, to the surface. And what impact has this had on you or your clients by asking the what and the why question? Well, I mean, I can share just a, a simple practical point that I had in, in my uh, life because uh, many years ago, I used to be traditionally ruled by activity so i'd measure activity and, uh, and that's the way the accountancy profession worked and so many other businesses work and i i was uh, reading a lot going to conferences listening and uh developing myself and i, I sort of 
came across this whole question of uh, what and why. And uh, I, I wrote down for myself, my own personal goals. So I had my health goals, my wealth goals, uh, my business goals. And so I, I wrote them down and put them on the uh, um, kitchen board. And I said, uh, in five years, I will have five properties. I'll have uh, one property a year. And I found out that at the end of the first year, I had three properties simply because that I would um, saw it there and I thought, well, I bought one, why can't I buy another? And you just change your whole mindset by having clarity and then um, you, you find ways of doing it. And so it just, you need to be reminded, you need to have uh, focus and then um, you make decisions and act on them. And it's the same with businesses. I've, I've seen loads of businesses uh, who ask themselves the wrong questions. And I, I remember listening to um, one businessman who suddenly went uh, ballistic. And what I said, well, what, what was the difference between uh, your business last year and this year? And he related it to football. And he said, uh, I knew we had good product, but he, I realized my customers um, were, if, were sort of second division customers. And I thought, why am I dealing with second division customers when um, I could quite happily deal with the uh, premier division? customers and so he just changed his whole approach his whole marketing his whole emphasis in terms of um, explaining the benefit of what he did to a much more successful uh, customer base transformed his business sold it out for millions yeah wow wow he was clear on his what and his why and uh, he wasn't going to accept any less than dealing with premier league clients and Absolutely. that's another really valid point i mean sometimes we hang on to clients that really uh, aren't in in alignment with uh, you know who we want to serve and how who we can serve the best it's interesting once you let those go how much time and energy is uh, is freed up and for you amazing you know, uh, a target of five properties in five years uh, probably sounded like a big thing at the at the outset of that because of course for uh, you know, for, for many people looking to get into property, it is, it can take a long time to do that. But you to, uh, to accomplish three in one year, that's uh, pretty amazing, the, the power of getting clear on what you want and focusing on it on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really is important. Uh, I mean, I've got another client uh, at the moment who's really successful going through a, a sale. And he uses the term, um, people, my customers travel with me first class. So in other words, his service does, because he charges far more than anybody, uh, anybody else I can see in his industry. And uh, because he makes sure the experience of coming back to the pineapple, he makes sure the experience is world-class. And he said to me, he said, I want to make sure that uh, your ex the experience you give me is also first-class. So uh, he said, so that we're totally um, working on the same page. And, uh, and this again, when you're talking about with your team and the culture, uh, I, you know, I always say to my team, if you don't return a call, if you don't reply to an email, that's a hanging offence. I said, no, we're all human. And uh, I said, things, uh, technology happens, things could get missed. But I said, you, you can't, it can't become a habit because that just becomes uh, an issue um, in terms of your mindset that you find is acceptable. Um, it's like being, being to meetings on time or whatever. Um, it's an attitude of mind and you just have to, uh, have to get it right. So he's saying traveling first class, um, I've been with this guy now, um, growing, helping grow his business. And uh, we're just about to see a multi-million sale. And uh, it's, it's really quite satisfying when you just deal with the basics. I mean, I don't do anything with his business. He knows how to run his business. I'm there just to actually help um, be a sounding board um, and help with the culture and taking it further. Totally love that. And there's something in the power of standards there. The standard that he would accept for his customers is nothing less than first class. And the standard that he was demanding from you as a uh, supplier to him was also first class. Uh, I wonder what happens when we set those standards in our life and we don't tolerate anything less. Yeah, there's a, exactly. a real, real powerful point and a real powerful principle in there. Uh, let's talk a little bit about... Um, you know, this uh, mountain climbing thing that you have going on. You've, you've scaled a few different mountains and I know we were fondly talking about uh, the experience of Mount Kinabalu uh, before. So uh, what is it that's driven you to have uh, adventurous pursuits like that outside of the uh, reasonably safe realms of, uh, of accounting and coaching? Uh, well, basically I'm a sports fanatic, um, So I, but I'm a, I'm a watcher rather than a doer. I mean, I always used to be a doer. Um, so golf, golf is now my main... Uh, um sport if i'm if i'm going to call it a sport uh, but i've also got a wife that's uh, 18 years younger than me and uh, so ah. from from that point of view she's she is a real fitness uh, freak 
and so she uh, she loves uh, anything she loves the outdoors we both love the outdoors so we li we live on a um, at the bottom of a hill and so when we sort of get up in the morning turn left walk the dogs up the hill um, it's just part of uh, part of our culture part of the way we are and people always laugh when uh, I'm sort of posting the weather reports and say so looks like it's going to be a great day have a you know ha happy Wednesday to you whatever it is and uh, people laugh and say oh we didn't get our weather forecast I said well it's miserable I don't want to post anything that's miserable so but when it's <laughs> something that's really good I'll post something that's positive and I think uh, it just becomes part of the culture and so mountain climbing just became part of it and I, when we went to Patagonia I, I don't think I was one of the older climbers but uh, I remember the guide looking and said you know um, uh, is he going to be able to make it and I just laughed because I thought I looked at some of the other party they might have been younger but I thought I bet they're not climbing hills every day and uh, sure enough uh, my wife and I were always at the um, front when it, it came to reaching the top of the uh, uh, mountain we were climbing totally love that and uh, there's a, a solid metaphor there around your habits climbing the hills every single day uh, I wonder for you given that you accomplished so much uh, in your career and in your life what's what's on the bucket list what's uh, out there for you in the future that you still want to maybe go and experience or accomplish oh I mean I think travel the world the world is the oyster so you can never I mean I'd, I'd certainly want to return to um, Patagonia for example but um, seeing there's so many places uh, you just you're your brain is a sponge, you know, the experiences you can find, the cultures. I remember taking my uh, son out to Africa. I was brought up in Africa as a child and I took my son out and he, he came up to me. This is, he was just early, just about 20, I think it was. And he said, you know, why did your mum and dad hate you so much to uh, make you live in this area? And uh, I just said, well, you know, the circumstance, you can't necessarily control your circumstance if you're employed by the situation. But I said, why do you think this is so terrible? And he says, well, look at the poverty. And I, I said to him, well, just uh, look at all the kids running around here. And I said, tell me, show me one that's not smiling. I said, they don't realize that they're poor. They're only poor in your eyes. In their eyes, they're not poor because they do not know what you've got. And I said, it's again, it's an attitude of mind. And I, so I feel privileged um, that my life has allowed me to go and see the different ways people live and uh, um, you know, and realize that happiness is not about money. You know, happiness is about so much more than just money. Money helps, um, you know, and it gives you uh, comfortable ways of living. It gives you the ability to go and see, uh, see the world. Um, you know, when I was in Rwanda and seeing the gorillas in Rwanda, um, that was an amazing experience. Um, and again, I saw the kids there and one kid came up and said, uh, what sort of iPad have you got? I was just totally astonished, you know, they were living in a, effectively in a mud hut and they had an iPad, but the government there um, had actually made it imp so important that every child, um, they had a goal, that every child would have an iPad in their hands for their part of their education. They were determined to make Rwanda a um, very much IT literate uh, generation and country. Wow. Amazing. So, again, this is all part, so you, you know, they, they suffered from genocide like so many other places. It's, um, but then you see the positive that comes out of uh, things like that. And so when they've been through, you just think they could be, just be downbeat. But no, the kids didn't, you know, those kids that didn't come through that. Their parents had to suffer all that um, and were really happy. And they, they wanted to know, well, you know, are you on Facebook? Are you on this? Are you on that? And so they were engaging in a way that I was just not expecting. So bu yeah, bucket, the bucket list is more of that. More experiences of travel. And it's, more experiences, uh, yeah. Get to know more yeah. people. Yeah, it gets to know more people. And it's uh, su such a, a very interesting thing, like you say, when you go and see the different way different people live, it does change your perspective. And you you made the real valid point there about uh, money. You know, money isn't you know, the creator of happiness. And I think I was reading one of the, the money psychology books around this, which is actually money helps create happiness, but not in terms of being able to buy you the material things. It's not what creates the happiness, but it's to buy you the uh, the time, so the choices to be able to do things. That's where it can have a, uh, a pretty decent impact on how you feel in terms of uh, in terms of your happiness. So, yeah. well, uh, Mike, you have shared such a wealth of wisdom with us today. Like, I, I really appreciate it. If there, uh, if someone's listening and wants to get in contact with you, where's the best place for them to uh, to come find you? Just Mike at mikeogilvy.com. Okay, straightforward nice, nice to everybody. 
wherever you're listening, check the uh, show notes. I'll put the link in there uh, for that. And of course, for X5 Accountants websites. So you can contact Mike. Mike, was there any final messages you wanted to share with the audience? Not at all. Just uh, uh, other than um, be positive, um, be focused and be happy. Be positive, be focused and be happy. And I'm going to be grateful and thankful for the time we spent today. Thank you so much. Okay, Kevin. Lovely to be with you.